Hello, I'm Michael Curland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Be Better podcast. I'm your host, Michael Curland. Joining me today is Mike McFall, co-CEO, co-founder, co-visionary of Big B Coffee. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're su- super excited to have you here. Um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do and, and your organization, your story and all that good stuff. Yeah, sure. You know, my, my day job, uh, my day job is is the co-CEO, co-founder of uh, Big B Coffee. Uh, we are a, a retail chain of coffee shops. It's under the franchise business model. Uh, we're based out of uh, East Lansing, Michigan. And, you know, we've been doing that for a long time. We've been at it 26 years. So, you know, we... Um, uh, we're having a real good uh, moment right now in our business, and we have a lot of growth going on and some real innovation occurring, which is which is amazing. Um, you know, I, I did I did start as a barista in our very first store. Uh, worked uh, you know from op- open till two p.m. Monday through Friday, and I was at that point I was in process of uh, preparing to go back to graduate school. I was working on a very specific research project at the university in East Lansing, and you know it was going to get published on some papers and, and, you know, just getting ready to, to apply to go back to school. And, and frankly, you know, I, I, two things happened. One, I fell in love with the coffee business. Uh, I fell in love with going to the, going to work in the morning. And I love the, the concept of making people happy. I mean, it was like the, the greatest gift in the world was to have somebody walk in in the morning and, you know, you could tell they were a little sluggish and, you know, <laughs> barely awake and maybe not looking forward to their day and just being able to engage them in a way that, that they, they walked out with a little more energy and, and you could tell you had a, a positive influence on them. Um, you know, I attribute that to why I'm in the business today. Uh, and, and then, you know, the other thing that I sensed was a real opportunity in coffee. I mean, this was back in 1996 uh, and, uh, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this thing was coming at us. And, um, and so, you know, I partnered, uh, the, the gentleman, uh, that owned our first store, uh, you know, I partnered with him, we set up a new entity. Uh, and then, you know, with that entity, we, um, decided to franchise the business. And so uh, we, we've been working hard at that ever since. And uh, we became legal to franchise in January of 1999. And, and you know, the business model itself is uh, is really unique and, and interesting. And, you know, franchising, I think, sometimes has a, a, a some, somewhat of a negative connotation in certain circles, you know. But I'll tell you, to me, it's a, it's a remarkable uh, business model. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it any other way uh, at this point. Uh, you know, I think the the biggest thing that's happened to us in the last five years uh, is that we we worked really really hard. Uh, we brought in an outside um, uh, coach uh, to help us work on purpose inside of our organization, and, and it sounds crazy, but we spent over two years on that with him. Uh, but we came out of that with something that really aligned well with us and uh, and also with our business model, which is our purpose is to support you in building a life that you love. And it, the you pertains to anybody we come in contact with, whether it's a customer, a barista working in one of our stores, um, hopefully people listen to this podcast. You know, the, the idea is, is that we're here to support you, whoever you are in building a life that you love. And it's really been a powerful thing for us. Yeah, that was, thank you. That was great uh, intro. And, uh, you know, I got a lot to unpack with that. First, I want to ask this, and, and I hope that you, you, you don't mind sharing this story, like how... How do you go from um, a, a barista on a you know a walk in the park with uh, the founder of the coffee coffee company to like co CEO co owner in a, in a conversation? How did that conversation go? Well, it, it, we had one store at that point, and he he had developed that store and he wanted to grow the business, and so we the story goes that that we sat down in a sort of traditional type interview environment where he was going to interview me about becoming a manager for his second store that he was opening. 
end result of that was we we popped up. It was a beautiful spring day. We popped up and went for a long walk around East Lansing, you know, three and a half, four hours. And at the end of that, we shook hands and agreed that we wanted to um, partner uh, and that we wanted to develop the brand, develop the concept Big B Coffee uh, together. And, you know, it, it was and we didn't form that company for another 15 months after that conversation, but uh, we shook hands and that was it. And the next day I went to the university and I, I, um, I was working there as, on a research project and I uh, resigned uh, from that position. And I just went full on into uh, managing this business and helping grow this business. We were equal partners. And, you know, at some point, I don't, I don't even know what year it was now, probably, I don't even, 2013, we, we agreed that, uh, that we, you know, we were, we were both managing the business. And so that's why we took on the title co-CEO and, and we'd always work together, uh, 50, 50. So there was no real transition in terms of what we were doing or how we were doing it. And, and it was, uh, it was, it, you know, it was, it, we didn't announce it. We didn't make any big splash about it. We just did it. And, you know, over time it just became what it was. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's amazing. You obviously have a, a way with words <laughs> to, you know, and you you obviously knew, like you said, you saw a coffee come in. So let me ask you that. You, you mentioned when you were in your, your intro, that you saw that it was coming at, at you fast. What did you mean by that? Is that the coffee industry was about to explode? Well, the growth rates in specialty coffee were dramatic. And so there was an enormous percentage of the population that was transitioning from Maxwell House, Folgers, McDonald's coffee to a more premium product. And it was happening in a lot of different products at that time. It was happening in bread. It was happening in beer, right? So this wasn't, coffee wasn't the only industry that this, that this concept landed. Um, and then Starbucks was rolling out from, uh, Seattle to Chicago and they were, they were having a very successful rollout in Chicago. And so that's what I mean. It, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there was going to be a lot of growth, uh, in coffee. The other piece of it though was, you know, I had, I had insight into our concept and I knew that my business partner, uh, Bob Fish was doing things very, very differently in coffee than anybody else. And I also saw that as a real big opportunity. He was a restaurateur. He ran high volume restaurants before getting into the coffee business. And so he knew how to organize a kitchen. He knew about operational flow. He, he studied that stuff. He was very, very good at it. And so, you know, that's, that made our concept different. And it's still one of the things that we lean on today, 26 years later, that makes us better, uh, is that, that the operational mechanism that we run day to day is more efficient. I love it. I love how you snuck in the better right there on the Be Better podcast. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so, I mean, you had you you obviously had the foresight. You had you had the uh, ability to you know see this coming, like you said, and um, walk away from a you know a research project, which I'm sure that that was like a, a huge hard right or left, however you want to look at it in your life. But you, you obviously felt passionate about it, and 26 years later, you, you definitely made the right call. I would assume you you would, you would assume, right? So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do wonder, you know, I, I mean, I love I'm in the middle of book projects and I teach now at the university here in Ann Arbor. And and, uh, you know, I, I think I was always meant to do that. And, you know, that project I was on was really cool. And, and I, I was most likely going to be able to handpick my graduate school. So the opportunity cost of that decision was pretty significant. And, <laughs> you know, looking back on it now, you know, yeah, it worked out. Right. It worked out. And in and, and my life's truly amazing but uh i don't know like I, I sometimes wonder what it would have been like if i stayed on that path well you, you you came full circle and like you said you're you're uh you're teaching over at ann arbor which i've been to lovely campus um i've never been to, to lansing however but um but yeah so talk to me you, you segue perfectly you're, you're just like teeing things up for me easily thank you mike i appreciate you doing my job um talk about let's talk about your books here you know you, you've written you've written one and you're about to finish up a second one. So what, what was your first book about in, in, in the title? I'll tell the audience and, and uh, let, then let's get a into the, the second one a little bit. Yeah, thanks. I, many, many moons ago, I had this project I wanted to write, which was I wanted to write about business development in the, in the development of, a, of an organization when I was doing it. 
right? I didn't want to wait until I was 75 years old looking back, you know, through rose colored glasses. And, and so that was really the premise of this project was, hey, let me let me kind of document this thing, right? Let me document how this is going and and try to bring some insight. And, you know, so so most books, well, let me first say my, my the first book that I've written that came out in 2018 is called Grind. And it's written about business startup. It's meant to be from the first day you commit to your new business to your first day of positive cash flow. Hold, and so, hold on one second, Mike. It's called Grind. Yeah. And what's yeah. the rest of the title? <laughs> it's a, a no bullshit approach to take your business from concept to cash flow. Come on. You asked if there was swearing on this podcast. So let's, <laughs> let's get that out of the way there. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the idea behind this book was I, I've done a lot of reading in the entrepreneurial space. And they're basically entrepreneurial books are written by two people, two types of people. And that is academics and, and then, you know, people that are, are, are through it, over it and are, you know, like, like to say flying around on their private jets, looking back through rose colored glasses. Right. And, and, you know, so those books are entertaining and I love to read them too. Right. Like I, I love to read about those stories, but you're really getting a very uh, glossy version of the story. And then academics do really important work and, and, but oftentimes it's not that applicable to what's going on for me and my business today. So I wanted to write a book that was written from the perspective of somebody that's in it. And, you know, my business model is supporting people and building businesses. And so I get to see a lot of stuff that occurs you know, when people are developing a business, things that work, things that don't work, um, attitudes, mentality. Uh, and so that's why I wrote book one. And, you know, the, the first chapter of book one is something that I've never seen done in the world before, which is... I talk about how as we start a business, we all do an enormous amount of due diligence and we study all kinds of different things. We start study pricing models. We study market share. You know, we study uh, contracts. We, you know, write business plans, do operating agreements and so on. The one piece of due diligence I've never heard anybody doing is, is doing due diligence on yourself as the entrepreneur. And I believe I believe most anyone can be a successful entrepreneur. So this isn't about whether you can do it or not. What it's about is evaluating yourself and figuring out what your strengths and weaknesses are. So when you go into the business, you know where you need to supplement and you know what areas might get in your way uh, as an entrepreneur. And so that's the, that's the concept. I did, I did something called the grind score and it's a, it's an online, it's a website uh, where you go in and answer 24 questions and I'll give you your, your, your propensity to be successful as an entrepreneur. <laughs> and then it's cool. And then you go in, if you, if you, if you're willing to give me your email, uh, I'll uh, give you detailed analysis of your answers. And, uh, and there's a little video clip that goes with each question describing my, my take on that question. So that's book one. What's and, and what's the, what's the website for that? Or can we share that? Cause uh, I'd love to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the, it's the grind score. Nice. Com. I'm going to take this and see. If uh, if I come out as a, as a yeah, we'll <laughs> yeah then you'll send me a note, right? <laughs> uh, so so that was book one, and I, I enjoyed writing it. Um, it it was for me, you know, I'm I'm really through that stage of my business. There's no doubt, but uh, but then I wanted to get into okay, well, what's next? You know, you've got your first day of cash flow. It looks like the business is going to work, and so how do we go from cash flowing, like your first day of cash flow, to sustainability? And that's what we're all striving for is sustainability. And and how I'm defining sustainability is, is that you as the entrepreneur could get run over by a bus tomorrow and the business would continue to thrive even if you're gone. And to me, that's the definition of sustainability. So that's book two. I'm super excited to get that one out. That'll come out uh, either late summer, early fall uh, this year. We'll have to see how much the editor uh, wants to engage, <laughs> uh, which is probably a lot, right? But anyway, so so book two will come out, and that's uh, it's really a book on business management and and how to approach. Um, you know, and it's a you go through a transition as an entrepreneur. I mean, when you hit your first day of cash flow, you're still bootstrapping. You're still doing almost everything. You're in the middle of just about every, anything that happens day to day in the business. And then you got to go through and transition all the way to the other side of that, which is you're sort of irrelevant to the day to day operations of the business. And you could get run over by a bus and the team would be able to carry the business forward. So it's a it's a really big transition. And most entrepreneurs struggle to make that transition. I can tell you, yeah. And again, thank you for going into that. I can tell you from my personal experience, that was the hardest part for me because I am, I'm the visionary. My business partner, John, is the operator. 
he came in uh, about two and a half years after I had done the grind, got everything up and running, you know, some of it well, some of it not so well. And then he took over the things I didn't do well. And I started losing purpose. I started feeling like I, do, you know, I'm, am I lazy? Am I not? Am I not contributing enough? Like, what do I, what am I doing here? And I got, my ego got really bruised and we started fighting a lot. And in retrospect, I won't put on my rose colored glasses. It caused a lot of issues because I couldn't, he, he came in and his ego got inflated because he felt like he saved the business. Not that we were on the verge of like ever losing the business, but he turned the business around. And I can't, I stepped back and I'm like, wow, I could not handle these portions of the business correctly. And now, you know, we're, we're, we're like two brothers and it's great. But, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a good six month period where uh, I walked into a room and I saw him and it took everything I had not to want to sock him in the mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, the, the thing that, that gets, in people's way. And it's, it's so hard to think about this if you're not in it. But when you bring people on board, and it sounds to me like this is what happened for you is you bring people on board, and, and they start doing the job, and they may be doing it differently than you would. And it might not work perfectly, just like how you were going to do it might not have worked perfectly. But when it doesn't work perfectly, and somebody else is doing it, you, you can, you know, uh, it's hard to let that happen, right? It's hard to let somebody else take the, take controls, take the control of things and, and start to do their own, you know, uh, work their own way, uh, and then not intervene, right? Like that is a really hard thing to do. And I'm, I'm, I still live it today. There's no doubt. And, you know, I'm pretty deep into this process. Yeah. I can tell you there was a good during that six month process that we were going through. I pretty much intervened every day and he would finally would, was like, can you just let me do my job? And I was like, you know, that, that makes sense. I should just let you do your job. You don't intervene with sales. So let me, let you, let me get out of your way. And th that shifted everything. And that got us to, ca that actually got us to cash flow. And then where we've gone since cash flow is now like, I mean, I'm honestly working less hours now than I've ever in my life. I'm loving it to, to echo your sentiments. I am living a very blessed life and, and I'm very happy. Uh, and now I have time, free time to do this podcast and work on, on my book. So yes, definitely, definitely understand where you're, where you're at with that. So you mentioned pre-show, we were talking about building, supporting and nurturing concepts uh, in the environments in the workplace. Let's talk a little bit about that because you were super passionate about that. So tell the audience your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, this, this, the, all of this is in book two and, and I'm in the middle of that right now, but as leaders, what's just really critical is that we, and, and, and this is so pertinent today around the great resignation and why people are jumping from one company to another, that, you know, you need to build an environment that is nurturing and supportive of the individual working in that environment. And I, I think that what we need to do is we need to invest in people before they invest in us. And that's backwards thinking from a traditional perspective. Traditionally, you expected them to be loyal you because you wrote them a check that, by the way, they could get pretty much anywhere else in the world. But because you're writing them a check to show up and do a job, you expected loyalty, you expect, expected their best efforts, you expected them to show up every day and have a good attitude and so on and so forth. Well, you know, I, I think that that's, there's a lot of fallacy in all of that. Uh, and so what I advocate is, is as the employer, as the manager, you have to invest in them first, and then you build trust. And with that trust, you end up in a place where they will commit to you. They will be loyal. They will want to uh, work hard to uh, bring their best stuff every day and so on. And, and so I, you know, I think that in so many ways, uh, the world is changing and, you know, we need to be approaching our people uh, from the perspective that, you know, I love the idea of when you think about your employees, they're somebody's child. And, and what would it, you know, if that was your child, 24 years old, coming out of college, maybe it's their first job, how would you want them to be treated? What kind of environment would you want your child to be in? And shouldn't we all be creating those environments where we're investing deeply uh, in people? And, you know, in our, in our organization, we do a, quite a few different things to try to make this happen. I mean, one thing that we do is we 
have individualized coaching for every employee. And they get an hour a month with a dedicated coach uh, that works with them. And it, it isn't about making them better at their task or their job. It's life coaching. And it's about supporting them and building a life that they love, helping them figure out their passions, pursuing their passions, and so on. And and people leave. <laughs> Frankly, yeah, people leave based on, on the fact that they decide that they want to go open a cupcake shop or, you know, they want to move to, uh, to Denver and, and ski more or whatever it might be. And, and so we do lose people around that. And, and I think from a traditional perspective, it would be heresy. Like here you're, you're just piling resources into somebody and then, and then you support them leaving and doing something else. But the long run on that is that, when somebody goes through a process, and we've got processes in place to help people walk through uh, this this idea of understanding and pursuing their passions and building a life that they love, when they go through all of that and they get to the end of that, and Bigby Coffee is a part of a life that they love and that they want to be there and, and make Bigby an integral part of, of, of their life and, and so on, and they've deliberately decided that, that person is a superhero. Right. They're, they're like, they're, they're just incredibly dedicated to, uh, their position, their job, the people they work with, uh, and, and so on. And, and so this concept of building a supportive and nurturing environment for the people that work for you, I think good managers through history have always done this, right? Like you think back and you got managers that you think are awesome and you got managers that you just couldn't stand working for. I bet you go back and you, you understand the managers that were awesome and you think about them. I think this is the stuff great managers have been doing forever. Yeah. Uh, wow. I mean, I just want to go back to you. You give an hour a month of coaching to every one of your employees. I love that. That's so forward thinking. And especially with everything that's going on right now, and you, and you nailed it. You know, if they want to leave and go be a ski bum or, you know, maybe that's a negative connotation. If they want to leave and go be a skier, that's, you know, that's their dream and you support you, you, you live what you say, support you in building the life you love. Right. But if they like, to your point, if they stick around, it's because they actually really love Big B coffee and they aren't going anywhere. So you've just created this, um, this place for them to, to be themselves and kind of, you know, grow into that, grow into that loyalty. Like loyalty doesn't come from a check anymore. To your point. I really right. like that. And I think, yeah. To, to your point as well, when I left to start Branded Group and we wanted to be better. And the reason we wanted to be better is because of exactly what you just said. And I never actually was able to connect those dots before, but there was management. There was two managers, two big managers overarching in, in my previous company and one managed by fear. He was, he was a whipping, you know, he would whip. He was like riding his horses until they would die. And I did not get along with him. And then we, we had another guy who just managed, you know, with letting people play on their strengths and, their, and then didn't maybe focus so much on their weaknesses and gave the weaknesses to other people that were strong in that, in that aspect. And I learned so much from that. And that's why, you know, we've put that into place at Brandon Group. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing here. So no, it's, but that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like, you know, and, and, you know, another thing that we do in our organization is for every five months, or I'm sorry, every five years you work with us, you get a three month paid sabbatical. So every five years, we'll, we, you, you have to, you have to take all your big B technology and hand it in. So your computer, your phone, you can, we change all your passwords. So you cannot, you, know, you can't physically work anymore. And then you have three months to do, pursue anything. Do, yeah. do and whatever then, you want, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's awesome. I'm actually taking my sabbatical this May uh -huh. <laughs> for the first time. For the first yeah. time. So where are you going? Uh, I'm going to stay here in Ann Arbor, but I'm going to, I'm going to write my the third book. That's the, that's the idea. And what's the third book going to be about? It's going to be called Grace. And, and, and the premise is that, okay, so now you have a sustainable operation, sustainable business. I, you know, by definition, you've got resources, I meaning you have people, uh, you probably you know, have pretty significant wealth. And so now what? The end game is not, you know, a third house in Florida and a private jet. That's not the end game. The end game is how do you improve the human condition? How do you, how do you take what you have and you've built so successfully and apply that to improving what's going on in the world? 
And to me, that's leadership. And that's the, that's the premise of the third book is, is let's transition our thinking on leadership to, it isn't just about building an organization and getting rich. That, that isn't, I mean, to me, that's not leadership. Leadership is you've great built that. That's awesome. And, and I hats off to anybody that can do that. But then what, like, what's it all for? Right. And I'm, I'm aligning with what you're saying. So tell me like, what's, what does that mean to you? Like, what do you want to do to create a better humankind support, support, uh, the life that the people live that you want to help? Uh, permission to go a little out there. Go. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, yes, we so, swear so we here, go out there. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our, here's our, here's the theory premise that we're working under. Okay. That the, the leading cause of death in the United States is chronic disease. Right. The leading cause of chronic disease is stress and anxiety. Right. And lack of sleep. Yep. Yep. The leading cause of stress and anxiety is but one financial two workplace. Yep. So we believe there's a direct correlation between workplace culture and the leading cause of death in the United States. hundred percent. And, and if we, and if we, you know, if we can take and influence the world in some way where workplace cultures can improve, become supportive and nurturing. When you leave work at night, you go home invigorated. You probably don't go to the, you know, first step in the door, go to the bar and pour yourself a drink. You probably don't go grab a gummy, right? Uh, your conversation at the dinner table is probably significantly better with your spouse and, and, and your children. And so what we're up to is to improve workplace culture in the United States and really take on the fact that the workplace uh, has dramatic impact on people's daily lives. And we want to change that. Agreed so much. We spend more time with, it used to be in, in office than we did at home with our families. Now, you know, I'm, I'm sure for you guys, it's still, you have to, obviously you're providing a in-person service. So they're still going to uh, the coffee shop. But for us, we all work from home now at Branded Group. And, you know, how can we make that a better place? And we we actually just finished our wellness survey for it. We do it every year. And it was eye-opening this year of, of the things that uh, the people wanted and that we're going to make changes on. So um, I'm excited. How was the, what were the results? I mean, was it improved? It's, it's shifted, right? Because we went from being in this office 40 hours, if you were lucky, a week, um, in 20, you know, March, 2020. And now we haven't, we haven't been back since. So this is really our, you know, first survey after a full year of like not freaking out about the pandemic as much and still kind of, um, kind of settling into the new role, new, new, like, uh, routines. So it's been eye opening. Yeah. Like people, people want to still go to the gym, but it's, what does the gym mean anymore? Like, are you going to a big box retail location or are you, is your gym, your home gym? And like, we offer gym reimbursement, but does that gym reimbursement only count if you go to said big box? No. We, so we have to rethink all these things. So, you know, uh, yeah. yeah. So we're like, we got a bunch of Pelotoners that are I don't know, myself included and, and they want to, they want to get credit for their Peloton, you know, riding their Peloton because their subscription is about the same as a gym membership, right? So these are kind of the like nuances of the new way we're thinking. Um, but it's been eye opening, and I, and I literally haven't even got a chance to pour through all the results yet. But I can tell you, like, they're different. That that I can tell you, starkly different than any year we've ever done it before. That's so, going to be fascinating to look at. That's going to be really fascinating. Yeah, totally. So I'm I'm excited to dig into that, and I love everything you guys you guys stand for and what you talk about. Like I thought I was doing culture well, but you just uh, schooled me on a few things here. Um, and clearly, you know, you're, you're, you're a hundred percent right. And, and I don't think, I mean, I've never put all those in a, in a blockchain, right. Where, you know, chronic disease, it's from stress and, and financials and, and it starts at the workplace. Right. But it's so simple. So I, I love what you're doing. So how, like, like what, what do you think you can do? How do you think you can affect the change Besides just the culture, like what, what are some ideas if you feel like sharing? I'd love to hear them. Well, it's been, I mean, it's been a real journey. I mean, we've been at it now three years and we're learning a lot. And, and, and one of the things that we learned just recently is that 
there's a, I forget her name, but there's a researcher at Harvard that, that talks about, did a lot of research around signal and antenna, right? So you send a signal, but if it doesn't match up with the frequencies in the antenna, it doesn't matter what you're saying, they can't hear you. And so what we were finding is that we were approaching people from a, a different language and a different perspective that wasn't matching up with their antennas. And we've just realized this in the last probably 30, 60 days. And so, but some of the things that we're doing, we have a, a full curriculum built out. It's called, um, the, we, it's called the Life You Love uh, curriculum. It's four classes. And anybody that works in our organization can go through them for free. And they really address some fundamental issues in relation to, you know, kind of what we think people should be, have a, rel a good foundation built on, right? And so, you know, um, one is uh, personal vitality, right? I mean, are you a vital person, right? Like if you're not, if you, if you don't have vitality, then it's gonna be difficult to pursue a life that you love. Right. And so, you know, that could be physical, uh, that can be emotional, uh, that could be spiritual. It, you know, there's a lot of different forms of vitality. But, you know, and, and that's a good example. People are like we're like vitality. What? <laughs> so we, 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 we've been working on that. Uh, you know, another foundation is knowing who you want to be. And that's a, a whole course on visioning that I think should be mandatory curriculum in every high school in America. Um, that, the, that and how to be financially sound as well. I mean, I don't know how we don't. Well, that's the kids. that's the next one, which is cool. <laughs> being able to, yeah, the, the third one is exceeding your basic needs, which is all financial, right? Financial planning, um, and and how to save and and how to think about money from a different perspective. And then the, the last one is having a sense of belonging, and that is you know, everybody needs their tribe, right? Everybody needs their people, and 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 so those are the four classes that we've developed. They're they're pretty awesome. Uh, and we get a lot of great feedback from people on them. And, and that's one of the things uh, that we're doing. Uh, we're pursuing, a, you know, my book project is a lot about this concept, right? So, you know, that's a big part of what I'm doing is, is bringing, I hope this content into the world in a, in a, in a conversation and in a way that leaders can understand it and not be put off by it. And that that they can accept the the rationale and the uh, the theories behind it, you know. And and so um, I'm learning better how to communicate, so I don't put people off. I've I've definitely had my days where people are like, "Dude, whatever, man, like, <laughs> like get lost," you know. Like it's one of the I don't know how familiar you are with something called conscious capitalism, but it's one of the things that I struggle with conscious capitalism about. So I go talk to people about conscious capitalism. They're like, "What? You're saying I'm not conscious?" No, yeah, no, I I am a member of the L A chapter. I'm actually trying to start the orange county chapter and that book is part of what like inspired my journey that and the e-myth e yeah so uh, yes, i yes i do know conscious capitalism very well um, yeah cool cool so so that's i mean that's what we're up to there's all kinds of other detail type things but uh the big things are this curriculum and then some of our policies internally uh like sabbatical yeah i mean i love it i can't you know, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around how we can give a sabbatical to our employees. I don't know if we could make three months work, but you know, it's not, it, 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 it's not a bad idea, right? It's not a bad idea at all. I'm sure that they love it. It goes by in a split second, by the way. Yeah. It's remarkable. Somebody leaves and you're like, I can't imagine what we're going to do for three months without this person. And then you're like, oh, you still work you know, here? <laughs> <laughs> cool. And, and, and it's, it's really a powerful thing. It is. Uh, That's and, life changing. Cool. That's life changing. You say, hey. You worked for me for five years. I mean, obviously, it inspires loyalty and other things, but you get to go on the sabbatical and you can do whatever you want. You can write a book, you can sail around the world, which you've done. So, um, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, well, listen, Mike, I I have really enjoyed this conversation. It's been great. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, if the audience wants to get a hold of you, how can they do so? You know, I think the most efficient way is is LinkedIn. Just, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, there's other social media platforms and so on, but that's the one I, I actually kind of pay attention to. Uh, and so LinkedIn, and then my email is Mike at big B.com. It's B I two G's B is in boy Y.com. And that's, that's also a, a, a pretty efficient way to get a hold of me. And, you know, if you, if you want to engage, I mean, that's what I do. It's what I, this is what I work on day in and day out. And I love talking about it. All right. Well, it's been great, Mike and audience until next time. Thank you for tuning in. 
I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There is no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.